Welcome to the podcast for Healing Neurology, where we talk about everything that can help heal your neurology, which is really everything from food, lifestyle, and medicine to nature, culture, and politics. There's no topic too big or too small. I'm Jillian Ehrlich, family nurse practitioner certified in Ayurveda and functional medicine. And I'm thrilled to have today Dr. Manish Butte. Dr. Manish Butte, who is an MD, PhD, he is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at UCLA and the Division Chief of Immunology, Allergy, and Rheumatology. He studied physics at Brown University, where he earned his Bachelor's of Science with Honors in 1993, studying mathematical neural networks. During this time, he developed software for Microsoft and Apple and performed research at the National Institutes of Health. He earned his MD degree from Brown University School of Medicine in 1996 and then studied protein crystallography at UCSF and graduated with a PhD in biophysics in 2000. Returning to clinical training, he completed a pediatrics residency at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in 2003 and a clinical fellowship in allergy and immunology at Boston Children's Hospital in 2006, where he specialized in the care of children with immunodeficiencies, autoimmunity, and autoinflammatory disorders, asthma, and allergies. This is like our wheelhouse. This is great. So during a joint postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard Medical School and in the Harvard Chemistry and Chemical Biology Department, he worked on T-cell inhibitory pathways and development of microfabricated tools to capture and study immune cells. He transitioned to Stanford University in 2009 to start his own lab in the Department of Pediatrics with courtesy appointments in the Department of Materials Science and Engineering and Microbiology and Immunology. His lab addressed fundamental, long-standing questions in immunology using innovative nanotechnological approaches to visualize and manipulate cells. In November 2016, he moved his lab to UCLA. So, and I'm going to start with just a little description about your lab. Um, so that people kind of have a sense of where we're headed with our talk today. So one major focus of his lab is understanding T cells, the major coordinating cells of the immune response, with a specific focus on mechanobiology. The group studies how mechanical forces influence T cells with projects spanning multiple scales from the molecular level, like how receptors in T cells sense forces, to the cellular, why T cells vigorously push and pull upon other cells, to the tissue, why T cells are hyperfunctional in soft tissues like autoimmune inflamed tissue and poorly functional in stiff tissues like cancers. His lab has innovated tools and techniques in the use of biological atomic force microscopy, AFM, and two photon intravital microscopy to interrogate cells and tissues. And the second major focus of his lab is in improving the diagnosis and treatment of genetic immune diseases. His group has developed CYTOF, cytometry by time of flight, mass spectrometry as a diagnostic tool for immune diseases. His lab has developed capabilities to study novel disease causing mutations across a number of diseases in children and adults. He is a co-investigator in the NIH funded underdiagnosed diseases network. He is one of the founders and co-directors of the California Center for Rare Diseases. Dr. Butte remains clinically active and is board certified in both pediatrics and allergy and immunology. He cares for children and adults in an immunology and immunodeficiency clinic uh, which is a Jeffrey Modell Foundation Diagnostic Center. All right, so let's talk about it. Let's dive in. Immunology, how do we think about, and, and just to preface this by saying, we've had some other immunologists on our show, and we've talked about immunology in the past, but I think it is such a complex topic that getting everybody's personal understanding and take and how they think about the science of, immun of immunology is helpful. So how do we think about the immune system what are the similarities and differences, overlaps or distinctions between allergies, autoimmunity, infections, and cancers? How do we think about the immune system? <laughs> okay, that's a big question. I know. <laughs> that might take more than an hour. Uh, so, you know, the immune system uh, probably evolved to help us fight infections. Uh, and if we understand that basis, then um, we can start to understand how the programs that we evolved to turn on the immune response and fight infections as best as we can, can sometimes go awry. And when those programs go awry, that's uh, when we think of things like autoimmunity or allergies. Um, so uh, a good example of that is the ability to fight any kind of virus that ends in your body, whether it's you know seasonal flu or COVID or some new avian flu that comes out of uh, left field. Uh, our body is ready for every single possible virus that comes its way. Uh, and that's kind of amazing. And to create the kind of diverse team of, of soldiers that can handle this flu or that respiratory virus or this other GI virus, to have that team of soldiers uh, requires diversity, uh, a lot of different training 
goes into the T cells and the B cells, these uh, white blood cells that have help us fight infections. That diverse pool of T cells and B cells that helps us fight um, creates, unfortunately, a side effect that some of those T cells and B cells may recognize our own body's proteins and mistake them for a viral protein. That They may say, this cell in your pancreas, that doesn't look right. Something's wrong there. Maybe it's a virus. Let's go. And next thing you know, you have type 1 diabetes. So once we understand that the, uh, the immune system evolved to fight infections, we have to start to understand then how does the immune system prevent fighting itself? Uh, and so a whole evolutionary layer has been built on top of our immune system over the eons to slow down the immune response, to put it into check, to turn down the heat when the fight is over, all these things to really try to make sure that we don't accidentally cause type 1 diabetes or other autoimmunity. And we do. We're all, we're all prone to these kinds of autoimmune uh, post-infectious autoimmune uh, consequences. And so one thing that I've come to understand is that evolution has given us a great way to fight infections, uh, though it's not perfect. And it's given us a pretty good way of preventing autoimmunity, but it's not perfect. And so there's always going to be jobs for people like me to try to understand uh, why it goes wrong in individuals and what are the best tools that we have to understand it and to treat it. Can you walk through a little bit of the different types of cells in the body? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I jumped, jumped ahead a little bit there, but um, no, that's great. you know, um, the immune system really is focused on circulating white blood cells. But before I jump into those, it's really important to note that in fact, every cell in our body has a little bit of immune system in it. A lot of the barrier tissues that we have from the, our skin to uh, the conjunctiva around our eyes to uh, the lining of our GI tract, all those cells are also part of an, of an immune system. And that front line of defense is what recognizes when there is a breach of the tissues. If I get scraped uh, or cut by um, some predator or, or a rusty nail on the fence, um, that breach of tissue integrity creates sets of alarms and the level of damage tells my body how much infection to expect. Uh, so those front lines of defense aren't usually what we think about when we think about the immune system. We think about white blood cells, but I just want to make sure that we get out there that we've learned quite a bit about immune deficiencies and diseases of the immune system that don't have anything to do with white blood cells. Mm -hmm. They have to do with those other cells. Um, susceptibilities to warts, for example, may uh, be a defect of your immune system, but they also may be a defect of your skin cells that don't know how to sound the alarm properly and say, hey, I'm under attack by these warts viruses, do something about it. Okay, so with that in mind, then we transition over to thinking about the circulating white blood cells. And there are many, uh, as I mentioned before, we have evolved a whole army and the military metaphor runs deep in this field, but we've evolved a whole army of cells that know how to fight different kinds of pathogens uh, that get called forth quickly in the first minutes of infection and get called forth later uh, to be more of the leadership and, and sort of round out and figure out what's happening here and sort of lay down a, a larger strategy. The, there is a, a very much martial metaphor um, when we think about these things. Mm -hmm. So um, the white blood cells that I think are really important for autoimmunity and maybe for some of the neurological diseases uh, are related to uh, what we call the adaptive immune system, the T cells and B cells. These are the cells that they're called adaptive because they remember previous infections and they help you fight them better next time. So um, if you get a cold, uh, you will remember that cold and not get a cold again for that whole season. Uh, because your T cells and B cells have plenty of uh, memory around that recent infection. And, and just like if you get a vaccine, you can create memory around those vaccines and protect yourself for five or 10 or even more years, as long as those T cells and B cells uh, remember those vaccine antigens and, and keep up their, um, their memory skills. So for some antigens, the memory is longer than others. And there's a lot to learn about how we can tune vaccines to make them better and better. But for now, it's just good to think about the idea that vaccines emulate infections and take advantage of this memory capability of the adaptive immune system. So it's, it's really, for me, a lot about T cells and B cells. And just to dive in a little bit deeper, B cells are the ones that make antibodies. They have antibodies on their surface, and as they become active, 
Uh, they start secreting those antibodies out, firing them out like um, like missiles that can then circulate through the blood and grab onto bacteria or viruses and help prevent them from spreading around the body. So those B cells are really important for creating a, uh, a protective response uh, to pre prevent the spread of infection. Unfortunately, B cells really get their uh, get to the real fight and the real oomph of their fight within one, two, maybe even four weeks after the infection. So you may think, wow, the infection's already over at that point. And it's true. A lot of B cell responses come late to the, to the first show. But of course, they're ready for the next time. And they really do provide a lot of the immunity, like those antibody tests that we do to see if you're immune to mumps or measles or COVID, uh, because those antibodies then last for five or 10 years and allow us to track what you've recently been exposed to, and how good you can protect yourself from it. T-cells don't make antibodies. T-cells are more like the lieutenants of the immune system. The helper T-cells really help the rest of the immune system figure out which way to go, what kind of bug we're fighting today. It's a fungus, it's a bacteria, it's a virus. They sort of coordinate and orchestrate the immune response. Uh, and then there's another branch of T-cells, the cytotoxic T-cells that fight viruses that kill virally infected cells. So those two T-cells and B-cells are really sort of the uh, the main problem solvers for infections, um, especially a little bit later after the war has begun. And they're also a lot of the troublemakers for autoimmunity. When you go to your doctor and you're like, oh, I have an infection, what gets checked in labs and how can we check if we have, if we're concerned about chronic infections, what can we check regarding B-cells or T-cells or what gets checked? You know, the count of white blood cells, how many you have, uh, mm -hmm. goes up during infections. There is um, a response, a trigger to danger that I mentioned earlier, the skin, perhaps the GI tract, some some danger signal gets alarmed that says something bad is happening to us. It's it's destruction of tissue. It's It's some kind of thing that is now burrowing through my skin or my lungs. When those alarms get set off, the bone marrow responds by producing more white blood cells. And so it, it tries to flush out whatever it's making. Whoever's in boot camp, strap on a pair of boots and go running out <laughs> to the battlefield. And so a lot of the immature cells make their way out into the blood and start helping to, helping to fight just to beef up the troop numbers. And so during early immune uh, responses to infection, you'll see the white blood cell counts rising. And typically those are the first line infantry that get to the fight. Those are neutrophils. Uh, very important for bacterial and, and fungal infections, not, not so much for viral infections. So those frontline troops make their way out, start fighting the best they can. And a few days later, the body can increase the T cells and B cells as their response shows up, as I mentioned, a little bit lagging behind. For chronic infections, um, the immune system has evolved a mechanism to slow down the immune responses. Uh, this is uh, something that was discovered in the 70s and uh, by Rolf uh, Zinkernagel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Rolf Zinkernagel, who coined the term exhaustion. And it's really a fascinating idea. And I'll try to sort of explain it quickly in that uh, if your T cells were continually fighting a virus for week after week after week, just eating up metabolic energy to, and glucose and all the nutrition your body takes in just to create more and more fighting, more killing, more cytokines, more alarms, more fever. Um, you will be sick. You'll be lying on your bed. You'll be shivering. You'll be losing weight. Uh, you'll look sick. You'll look so sick that you'll be unlikely to mate. And so evolution seems to have created this mechanism whereby if the T cell fight can't be won within about 10 days, it just gives up. It says, you know what? We're super unlikely to mate at this point. If we keep lying on the couch, shivering and losing weight, let's just stop fighting this virus, whatever it's doing to us. We're obviously not able to beat it. So let's just let it go. And maybe <laughs> if we're not so sickly looking, we can at least get to mate once or twice before we lose our liver or our spleen or whatever it is that the pathogen is coming after. Wow. And so this idea of T cell exhaustion is very interesting and in that T cells learn over about a week and a half to turn themselves off and say, you know what? I really do think that's a juicy antigen that I want to go after and keep fighting, but I got to turn down the heat because this is just not a fight that we've been winning. Um, so that continuous exposure to antigen is to antigens is what triggers exhaustion. And it's a fascinating swing of metabolism and, and programming of T cells into this off state 
that we can detect uh, that that has been detected in chronic infections like HIV and hepatitis C and other sort of chronic viral infections. I think that the chronic infection field has a lot to learn from these early studies in in the big name viruses like HIV and hepatitis uh, to start studying other other pathogens. But um, anyway, I think maybe that's uh, <laughs> that's enough of an answer, or maybe you can riff on that. No, that's a great, I mean, we have a lot of patients who struggle with chronic infections or symptoms that we think are from chronic infections that often get named Lyme or Epstein-Barr or even now long COVID. Yeah. And it's still quite controversial about what the true problem is. It may have started or it may be thought to have been triggered by a reactivation of those viruses, but clearly it's more than just the organism itself. It's the immune response. And so any light shedable on those experiences, I think is helpful. Yeah. Um, even if the T cells uh, turn themselves down or some of the major antigen sensing T cells turn themselves down, there will be ongoing T cell activity for weeks and months after an infection. Uh, and that's been shown for COVID now. That's been shown for a variety of uh, post-vaccine states. Uh, the T cells will continue to churn and mull over what they've been exposed to uh, at a lower level and at a lower level. And for most of us, uh, we turn off that T cell response after infection, as I mentioned, within a week or two weeks. And um, the lymph nodes stop swelling and the body starts to reset itself over the course of a few weeks to months. That process is not perfect. A lot of us end up having ongoing immune responses for longer. And in some special cases, in some kids that we take care of, it's a, a, a set of genetic variants that actually foil the ability for the immune system to turn itself off. They will continue to have lymph nodes swelling. They'll continue to make fevers. Their T cells will remain active for weeks and months later. They don't undergo exhaustion very well. They don't undergo program cell death. They don't turn down the war. And for some of those kids, in fact, for most of those kids, they develop autoimmunity uh, uh, during that ongoing fight. That autoimmunity is bystander attacking where a B cell may say, look, I really think there's still another pathogen there. I'm going to make more antibodies. And then next thing you know, it's attacking the pancreas or, or the, um, or other organs, the, the joints, for example. So post infectious autoimmunity is common for a lot of us. Uh, it often turns down as this response turns down. Uh, but in some people, it can go on and on and on and on for weeks or months. It can be very pathog pathological. There can be tissue damage, tissue injury, et cetera. So where does some of these other sort of chronic infections that you mentioned fall in that spectrum? Mm -hmm. We don't know. Uh, I can certainly say that Epstein-Barr has been heavily studied. It is a, you know, a common uh, human herpes virus. It's something that's 80% of adults are exposed to by the time they hit adulthood. And most of us can clear EBV to a level where it is no longer active. It can remain in our bodies for the rest of our lives. That happens to be the way that a lot of these herpes viruses work. They turn down their viral programs and they sit latent or dormant uh, for years. Chickenpox is another one of these viruses. There are many of these viruses that learn how to turn off their attack and sort of sit dormant for a long time, kind of like Godzilla lying under, you know, the Bay of <laughs> Japan, um, <laughs> waiting for something, some event to trigger it and, and come out again, maybe a weakening of the defenses, maybe something else. So EBV has been heavily studied and we now know of at least 20 different uh, genes and which is to say disorders of humans where EBV control is not so good. Uh, it doesn't go into that latent state. It remains highly active. These are patients with chronic EBV uh, actively detectable in the blood. It doesn't fade away like for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And for the, some of those patients, it can lead to all kinds of difficulties, including the development of cancers and autoimmunity because of this ongoing a relentless attack on EBV that just doesn't appropriately let up. But the other ones that you mentioned for Lyme, you know, it's, it's even less understood I think the best ideas are right now that the Lyme infection itself, the pathogen itself is gone, uh, but the ongoing immune response, as I mentioned, continues and directed at various targets like the joints or the skin or, or even the brain, it can lead to these uh, weeks or months or years of post-infectious autoimmunity that really is uh, not an active infection of those tissues, but it's the immune system that has been tricked into fighting parts of our body in an ongoing fashion. So, and at the risk of being too controversial, and so you're welcome to back out of this question if you'd like, 
there are so many patients who have been diagnosed with Lyme who do get benefit from months or even years of antibiotics. If yeah. it's not the organism, what is the mechanism behind that? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, antibiotics work in a lot of different ways. Uh, certainly, yeah. what well, one thing that we've come to learn is that antibiotics, of course, themselves have some anti-inflammatory properties. But mm-hmm. I think even more interesting than that is that antibiotics act on uh, the bacteria in our gut. And that is totally obvious to anyone who's been on a week of antibiotics. You know, you get some people get um, diarrhea. Mm-hmm. Most people get some kind of GI upset from being on antibiotics. It's great for the bacteria that live within us, the 30 trillion plus bacteria that we carry around in our guts to have these antibiotics coming in. And if it's a short course of antibiotics because you cut your thumb on, on the, on the fence, you know, and it's five days of antibiotics, your, your microbiome inside your gut will reset itself as you eat foods and as the bacteria replenish the, the order and the relationships they have with each other, your gut resets itself and then your poops become back to normal. Uh-huh. And, you know, <laughs> you really don't have to um, feel like you're in that, that sickly state uh, that the antibiotics are creating. Uh, with that in mind, the, the obvious uh, idea that antibiotics affect our microbiome, uh, it doesn't take much to then extrapolate as to where what a mechanism could be for how antibiotics help. We know that many of those bacteria that we have living within us actually have um, evolved over centuries to provide our immune system with cues. And those cues are super important for understanding whether they're infections or not, how healthy we are, how much nutrition is coming in. This is um, all kinds of sensors that we have deployed inside of our guts to tell us about the state of our being. Mm-hmm. Uh, sensors that can help us understand if we're starving, you know, hey, there's not a lot of nutrition coming in. Let's let the immune system know that because they need to know how are we going to do that? So these bacteria make molecules like um, fatty acids and sugars and uh, little peptides. And those molecules are sensed by the immune system in the gut. And the gut makes and holds up about one third of our immune cells at any given moment. Uh, They're circulating through our blood and through our lymph nodes and through our um, lymphatics, but also through the time, that time that those cells are sitting in the gut and getting exposed to those cues is a perfect time for the immune system to get uh, recalibrated into what kind of uh, state we're in. And if you're on antibiotics for weeks or months, you could end up with a change in your microbiome and a change in those cues uh, to create different conditions. Now, certainly there are antibiotics and regimens that create an immune state that is weak. Uh, We know that, for example, after a bone marrow transplant, a lot of patients get such heavy loads of antibiotics that their immune system itself is weakened by the consequences on the microbiome. And there's groups around the country trying to figure out how can we treat patients with bone marrow transplants and get them to remain uh, healthy and have their immune system not be uh, extra weakened by the effects on the microbiome. Okay, so that that's a more extreme example. Not all of us are getting bone marrow transplants. But for those of us who do get chronic antibiotics to treat things like um, chronic infections, the impact can be through these molecules, through the impact on the microbiome and then on those molecules that get generated and how much of a cue they give to the immune system to create war or to create peace or to try to suppress things or, or whatever it may be. I think the right thing to do next would be to try to understand what that impact is at a mechanistic level so that we can harness it instead of maybe accidentally getting taking advantage of it or not. And, you know, I didn't get a benefit from antibiotics. I did. That kind of mixed result is a cue that something is working and maybe it's not working the same way in everyone. And this is a chance to understand, well, how does it work and what, how, what can we harness from that so that we can make it work for everyone? Uh, in the future, that may mean not taking antibiotics, that might mean taking some of these molecules that the bacteria are making as cues to our immune system. And there are groups already working on this idea for resetting the immune system during food allergies. If you can feed your gut the right molecules that maybe your microbiome isn't making, that might be enough to reset your immune system to start tolerizing foods again. Do you have some examples of what those molecules are? Yeah, a a molecule that's extremely well studied is a short chain fatty acid called butyrate. Uh, Butyrate is made by some bacteria in the gut, and it seems to be a very important molecule for tolerizing uh, the immune system. Um, Another one is retinoic acid, you know, that comes from a vitamin. It's a, a precursor to vitamin A. But retinoic acid is also produced by bacteria and it is harnessed by the immune system, by different receptors in the immune system to create a tolerizing environment. So there are uh, fatty acids and vitamins and all these things that, that we maybe know that we should be eating and taking into our diet, but 
uh, their molecular influence on the immune system is just being discovered in the last few years. So there aren't that many stories to tell yet, but certainly many that need to be told. And there's some really interesting things that you specifically know about T-cells and ways that we can influence them from the world of mechanobiology. So first of all, what the heck is that? Mechanobiology is a um, is a study of cells and how they respond to forces. Um, and it sounds like a... Um, like in Star Wars? Like crazy, the, yeah, that, the, <laughs> the midi clergy inside our cells. No, no, no. I mean something more mundane than that, like mechanical forces. Like uh, when we stand up on Earth and within the gravitational field of our Earth, our bones and the cells of our bones are remodeling themselves, destroying some bone and creating new bone continuously to adapt to our gravitational field. That's why when astronauts go into space and they are exposed to microgravity, their bones say to themselves, well, okay, let's keep remodeling. Let's make sure we're adjusting all the right bones in all the right spots to for the gravitational field around us. Oops, there is no gravitational field. Let's just start deleting bone. And so the astronauts in space have very active bone loss the moment they get up in space. That's why all those ones in the space stations have to exercise on, with weight-bearing exercise continuously, because otherwise their bones will fracture by the time they come back to Earth. Even a few weeks in space is enough to cause serious damage to bone. Okay, so that's an example of how gravitational mechanical force affects our body. And it turns out that these kinds of forces are not just gravity, but cells pushing on each other. Uh, blood vessels pumping, the heart and its pulsatile blood flow, all these forces are actually harnessed by the body, uh, sensed by the body. Uh, they act as cues for, for degrees of health or uh, disease. And the immune system does it too. And so my group and a few other groups in the world have started to study how these mechanical forces actually act as cues. So one example that I can talk about that we recently published is the swelling of lymph nodes. It's been known for about 2,000 years that whenever there's inflammation, whether because of infection or because of cancer or because of a tissue injury or whatever, uh, a burn, whatever the cause of danger and damage to the skin, to the, to the body, the local lymph nodes will swell up and they will become red and warm and swollen. Uh, it has eluded us <laughs> until now to understand why the body creates a swelling response. What mm -hmm. is the purpose of swelling up your lymph nodes? What is that cue for? And so we decided to try to tackle that from the from using the tools of mechanobiology uh, applied to T-cells. And what we found is that the T-cells actually sense that swelling of the lymph nodes and they learn how to ramp up and also ramp down their activity, their metabolic activity, based on that mechanical cue that they're sensing uh, in the swelling of the lymph node. Hmm. So this is a way that the body can give a little bit of a hint to the T-cells. This part of the body is has these swollen lymph nodes. This part of the body is where you need to be more active, more vigilant, more ready to fight, more metabolically prepared to create uh, the war. It also creates a cue to the body to say, hey, this other part of the body isn't under attack. If you T-cells, as you course through the blood looking for infections, happen to wander into these tissues, there's no fight here. Don't worry. Even if you see an antigen you're interested in, it's probably just a self-antigen. It's not a bad guy. Don't bring the fight here. This is, um, you know, the green zone or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> So that idea that, that the mechanical cues can actually feed back to the T cells, uh, we think is actually one way to prevent autoimmunity. If you have a respiratory viral infection and all the parts up here are ramped up and fighting and your T cells happen to be coursing through your blood and make their way down to the pancreas and see your insulin making cells in your pancreas, they will be also sensing the mechanically soft environment down there and say, hey, this is not a battlefield. We're not in the right spot to be fighting. We should be a little more quiet here. You know, we're in the library now. Let's not, let's not make a fight. <laughs> and instead, they can quietly exit and not create type 1 diabetes. And so we figured out what is the sensor, what is the sensor that T-cells use to sense that mechanical stiffness. And we've uh, deleted it from T-cells and show that they will make more autoimmunity because they don't sense the quiet of the library. And uh, we've also shown that they can adjust the level of their fight based on what part of the fight is going on. So it's really cool that there are evolutionary pathways inside of these T-cells programs inside the T-cells that help them understand the mechanical milieu that they're in. Hereditary lymphedema, or does that play a role, do you think? 
Yeah, I think we haven't studied uh, hereditary lymphedema, but certainly lymphedema post-surgical or post-infectious um, does create this kind of environment. Uh, anything that where there is mechanical stiffness because of inflammation, we think is going to drive the T-cells into this metabolic state. And that could be uh, something that we can harness. We've actually built some tools in the lab to try to make T-cells more activatable just by shaking them and applying mechanical forces to the T-cells. Uh -huh. It sounds a little bit like something you could do in your kitchen. <laughs> right? It is actually not all that much harder than some, <laughs> some, some kitchen tools you might find. But surprisingly, if you can uh, expose T-cells to triggers that they want to feel activated and shake those triggers at the right frequencies, you can actually get the T cells to respond. And some of that response is super activation and it's kind of neat. I've been thinking about how evolution might have taken advantage of that. We haven't done these experiments yet, but I think um, uh, it would be really neat to be able to think about those frequencies and where they occur in nature. Uh, yeah. One frequency that we've tapped into is um, between 10 and 50 hertz, so cycles per second. And there's actually a source of that kind of oscillation or vibration in nature. And it's, um, it's cats purring. Uh, so cats purr at, at these frequencies. And it's been described before that cat purring is important for bone healing and wound repair, but no one's really been able to figure out how. So I'm kind of interested in this idea that maybe uh, these kinds of mechanical movements created by purring of cats, for example, or other things that maybe we're doing, shivering, for ha perhaps, those activities may be uh, driving a mechanical program for wound healing, for T-cell activation, for repair, for regeneration, etc. So we have a long way to go on this. This is very is fascinating. Idea. But I think it's something that we would love to be able to capture in the heart. Uh, you know, as the heart undergoes uh, uh, an infarction and parts of the tissue become scarred, they don't move much. They're sort of become fibrotic and dense and they're not shaking and moving appropriately. Maybe we can create programs that can um, oscillate these tissues in a way that regenerates them. Uh, I know this sounds kind of um, a little bit woo woo, but I, I really do think there's a lot to learn about how things like mechanical forces can uh, help our bodies heal. There's a lot to think about with that because there's ways that traditional medicine has used singing or drumming or humming or lots of, there's lots of rhythm in our environment or that there's lots of rhythm that humans have created over the millennia that is the way that we feel like we come home. And so certainly we know from social genomics that when a person feels safe, there's lots of anti-cancer genes turned on. There's lots of anti-inflammatory genes turned on. That if you spend an hour with people who you feel threatened by or feel like, you know, everybody's worked up or upset, you know, not even directly threatened, but, you know, everybody's worked up and upset, we turn on pro-cancer genes, we turn on inflammatory genes. And so I wonder if there's ways that we can absolutely use frequency, hertz, uh, oscillations, heart rate variability, other pets. <laughs> You know, meditation, uh, chanting, uh, you know, some of this stuff sounds like it could be influencing us uh, at levels that are cognitive, that you hear them and your brain can then influence parts of your immune response. And, and those circuits, of course, exist and we need to learn about them too. But the idea that these frequencies can directly affect the immune response, not through the brain, not through the processing capability that we have, uh, you know, upstairs. Uh, that I think is su super fascinating and, you know, needs to be exploited. Yeah. There's a type of um, pranayama of breath work in Ayurveda and yoga called Brahmari, which is bee breath. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you actually kind of close off the holes in your head and you hum. And theoretically it's for depression and anxiety and some other things. But I just wonder if all of that is working on that same mechanism. <laughs> Pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And one of the things that we talked about in the beginning, kind of inter in your introduction, was that stiff tissues, that in hyper, that that T cells are perhaps hyperfunctional in soft tissue. So we have a lot of patients in our septad that we call it um, that have hypermobility, mast cell activation, autoimmune, cervical cranial instability, or tethered cord, chronic infection. So in that hypermobility or Ehler Stamlos piece there's a lot of potentially hyper flexible tissue. And I'm wondering if you think that the reverse is true, that not just in like that in unstable, excessively flexible tissue, if there's potentially increased T cell activation. Uh, it, it's certainly I possible. It, no, I, I don't know. I don't have the answer. I think, you know, we're in the realm of speculation right now, which is fine, yeah. right? There's so much to learn and so much that we want to be curious about. 
Um, I, I think it is a little bit speculative. I am, um, you know, fascinated by the idea that collagen and genes related to collagen, which are um, strongly tied to these hyperflexibility and Ehlers-Danlos phenotypes are not just expressed in the skin and in the, you know, the joints, but also are expressed in the lymph nodes and also are expressed in the lymphatics. And so um, are there changes in these uh, connective tissues and extracellular matrices that are less apparent? Uh, something that you may see on the outside as a flexible joint may also be telling you on the inside that the lymph nodes have a different level of uh, mechanical flexibility during infections. Uh, that, that kind of thing, you know, we haven't studied yet, but it's certainly possible. Those same collagen genes are expressed in all of our, all of our tissues and certainly merit some degree of study. We have, um, a collaborator at UCLA who has been working on one of these collagen Ehlers Danlos associated genes. And, you know, I, I think, um, it's too premature to say. Uh, but we do think that there are differences in mechanosensing and mechanobiology effects based on the tissue mechanics. And so I had started this question by saying, like, is there maybe more T cell activation? But is it what I'm hearing you say? And I just want to clarify is that maybe there's even less, like maybe there's not enough T cell yeah. sensation so in hypermobile tissues. I, I think it's important to remember that. And, and you know, I in haven't speculation. Been, yeah, I haven't mentioned this part of the T cell response, but it's important to think about a lot when we think about autoimmunity and inflammation uh, are these T cells called regulatory T cells. So we have evolved a group of uh, a whole crop of T cells, something like 10% of all of our circulating T cells are regulatory cells. They uh, have evolved to turn down immune responses. Uh, they sense antigens uh, just like infections, um, just like the T cells sensing infections do. But instead of turning up a program to coordinate immune war and, you know, calling an airstrike, instead they slow down the immune response. They say, wait a second, let's not attack here. Um, one of the ideas is that regulatory T cells evolved in order to protect us from autoimmunity. That again, as I mentioned, the checkpoints that we have to slow down our immune response against self antigens are pretty weak. And so everything that evolution has layered on top of our immune system uh, to slow things down appears to be necessary, that we just have so such weak uh, tolerance of ourselves that you have to create extra mechanisms to create more tolerance to our cells. Those regulatory T cells have, thus, they're following a different program, you can imagine, than all the other what we call conventional T cells. So how mechanical forces affect regulatory T cells versus conventional T cells uh, is something that we're actively interested in studying in my lab, but we, we don't have the answer yet. But that could be what you're sort of getting at is this idea that there's more T cell activity or less T cell activity. Um, remember that more T cell activity for regulatory T cells is actually less of an immune response, right? Because they are right. suppressive cells. So uh, I know that sounds um, con <laughs> like, like a double negative, but that's, <laughs> that's the way a lot of, less. Parts of the immune system are built is, and I find this to be really fascinating that, the moment T cells get activated, within minutes to hours, they are already beginning to turn on genes and programs to turn themselves off. Mm -hmm. They have anticipated the war ending three days from now, five <laughs> days from so now. Nice. And they're like, you know what? I think this war may end five days from now. And let's already start turning on those genes in the first few hours. Because by the time we build those proteins and turn on all those signaling pathways and get them all built up, ready to sense the war being over, we want to be ready for it. We want to be ready for the ticker tape parade after the war is over and turn down the fight and send all the troops home. That idea is just amazing to me that, that evolution has this, has the on and the off running at the same time. And it's just a matter of balancing. Well, we need to be a little more on today. Let's not let's not call uh, call it off yet. The war is still going on, you know. Versus saying, "Hey, the war is off, guys. You really need to slow down." Like the idea that you can create that balance in signals, balance in cells, balance in in programs that the T cells are running all from the very moment the war begins. I, I think that's extraordinary. And I think there's it's where health really lies. Is not so much in being healthy, but being able to be balanced and be able to turn on the fight and turn off the fight in an appropriate fashion. If you can't, if you continue fighting for weeks and months and you're metabolically drained and you're fatigued and you, then you develop autoimmunity and, and fibrosis in your tissues, well, that's bad. And, and that's obviously bad. But what led to that might be something that started right from the first beginning minutes. 
So we want the right amount, not too much, not too, we want the Goldilocks of both the turn on and the turn off. So it's another, it's a whole nother access of the immune system. It's a whole nother access of like sentience in the immune system that is sensing itself. And And, and remember the immune system is getting cues from all the other parts it can, from the gut microbiome, from the tissue mechanics, from circulating, you know, vitamins and hormones that are uh, flying around. It's not a simple feedback loop like this turns on, then this turns off. There are so many forces uh, coming in. It's a, it's an equation with many variables. And uh, it's kind of amazing to me that it works out. <laughs> we do end up fighting a cold and our runny nose eventually stops. And five days later, we're sort of back to our degree of health after a, you know, a, a cold or something like that, that it all manages to turn up and turn off all at the right pace it is astounding to me. And it, it's, you know, as we reductionistically dissect all these pathways and molecules, we can name the genes and name the proteins and name the, the things that get turned on and name the things that get turned off. But it's how they all integrate together to yeah. create a working system, I think, that is um, so still a little bit elusive and still so fascinating to most scientists. Absolutely. Absolutely. It just reminds me of all the kids that I know that, you know, before going to bed have said, what if I stop breathing in my sleep? Like there's some way that we feel like if we're not paying attention, is it really all going to go Okay. But the truth is, is that it does. We make it another day and we're still here. Yeah. Um, and yeah. It's, it's still working. <laughs> yeah. Except for the patients, you know, who we take care of, who right. are in some ways experiments of nature. Nature has decided to throw a monkey wrench into this pathway that is not redundant. There's no other backup. And so if you can't really turn this thing on and turn this thing off in the right way, there wasn't another backup gene evolved yet. And so you're going to get stuck with some super activated T cell state or underactivated T cell state. And then you end up with, with, um, you know, chronic infections or, or infections that start in early childhood mm-hmm. and are unremitting, um, or, or severe autoimmunity. And, and those kinds of mystery undiagnosed cases are, you know, to me, um, the most fascinating. Many of these patients, don't get uh, to see a doctor who understands or wants to dig into the genetics and the immunology and understand how are these things interacting, what has gone awry. Uh, and so the idea that you have to be a scientist, uh, you know, I use the metaphor with my patients a lot of being a detective, like on those, you know, crime shows. And we have to interview a lot of suspects. Is it your B cells? Is it your T cells? Are you making <laughs> antibodies? And, you know, sometimes it's the boyfriend and sometimes it's the pool boy. And like, you got to interview just in those, in those crime shows. Uh, it, it sometimes takes you to the girlfriend and then no, it's not her. It's actually the other, the school teacher. Like, you know, the same way we, we dive into and chase down leads for which parts of the immune program are going right or wrong. And sometimes we get it right and sometimes we get it wrong and sometimes we we really get it right and we're lucky. Uh, we had a recent case of a boy who had a, a very serious fungal infection. It ha- happens to be very common in California, Arizona, New Mexico, and West Texas called Valley Fever. It's a fungus that lives in our soils in this part of America. And it stretches all the way down to Argentina, where the very first case was described in the late 1800s. Uh, it's going to be in our soils for the next million years. It's not ever going to go away. It's this part of our, uh, this part of the world. And when those soils get disturbed, like with agriculture or with construction, those spores can get into people's lungs and cause a, a virus, a, a fungal infection called valley fever. But in some small number of patients, it spreads out of the lungs and into all the tissues of the body, the joints, the skin, the brain, mm. uh, the bones, and it is super destructive. It eats our tissues for breakfast, literally has all the genes mm. and, and enzymes to eat our bodies. The same way that the funguses in our lawn have all the genes and programs to eat the grass and the weeds and things out there, uh, these funguses have lost those genes and have gained genes to eat animal tissue. Mm-hmm. So it's it's quite serious of a predator when it makes its way into these tissues. And uh, our only real response has been to give as much antifungal drugs as we can and hope for the best. And uh, in this little boy who was dying in our hospital, we um, we got called, the immunology team got called, and we found that his immune system was running the wrong program. It was not running the program to fight a fungal infection. It had been tricked somehow, probably by the fungus, to fighting a, running a different program. Uh, the example I often give is if you're trying to write a letter 
And instead of double clicking uh, to launch Word, you instead launch Excel. Mm -hmm. Now, everyone knows you can write a letter in Excel. If you just type all the words into box A1, it'll look like a letter, but it's much harder to write a letter in Excel than it is to write a letter in Word. Uh, you can do it. It just doesn't run right. It's difficult. You know, the copy and paste, everything is there, but it's not exactly the same. And that's what we found in his immune system, that it was running the wrong program. It was running Excel instead of running Word. To How fight. did you find that? We did a lot of deep dive genetic analysis on the programs that his T-cells were running. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that they were fighting a, a program that would be appropriate for fighting a parasite or even allergies. Mm -hmm. um, now, the real innovation came uh, when, when my lab discovered this and one of my colleagues who's an allergist here at UCLA said, well, why don't we use one of these new drugs that was invented to block allergies to see if we can push his immune system? And so we tested that in the lab and true enough, we can actually push his immune system back into fighting fungus uh, infections by blocking the molecules that allergy T cells were making. What? And, uh, and we, it, we took this drug that was invented for eczema and applied it to this kid who was dying of a fungal infection. And uh -huh. it totally changed the course of his, his disease. Wow. He cured himself over the next six weeks. His immune system suddenly knew what they were doing and fought like, you know, like, like hell. And they, wow. they were fighting and, and curing him. And he's cured two, two years later. Um, Which drug was it? It's uh, <laughs> it's off label, right? So this is not an appropriate use of this drug uh, oh, as per okay. the FDA. Uh, <laughs> doctors like me have to use drugs off label because we're yeah. trying to perturb the immune system. So it's it's meant to be used only right now in the hands of people like me who can test your immune system, figure out that you're running the wrong program, and then push this button in this way. Uh -huh. uh, with that in mind, the drug is called Dupilumab, and it was made for um, eczema. It's okay. been since FDA approved for allergic asthma mm -hmm. and for allergic polyps um, in, in, the, in the sinuses. So a lot of the severe allergies uh, really benefit from blocking these molecules that dupilumab blocks. Mm -hmm. In our case, in our kid's case, we were able to um, push his immune system towards fighting the right pathogen uh, by using this drug. Wow, fascinating. We are very interested in testing this in more than one kid. Mm -hmm. And we're working with the company to set up a clinical trial to test it on uh, other patients with severe valley fever. There are about 200 of them in California every year. Mm -hmm. uh, they cost our state about a billion dollars uh, wow. to fight. These are very sick patients. They live in the hospital for weeks and months. Yeah. They have to get spinal taps and MRIs and, and lots and lots of intravenous medicines to try to keep them from dying. And the mortality rate, especially once it spreads into the brain, uh, is very high. Probably half the patients will die from this infection if it gets that far. So that's an example of using something that we have or even something that's new, but in a different direction based on the logic of understanding the immune system. Right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the other techniques we have for impacting the immune system. And I want to specifically talk about what you and I originally met talking about, which was IVIG. Yeah. Um, and maybe mention a little bit about rituximab just because it's kind of in there as well. But sure. yeah, talk so, about these drugs. Right. So for many neuroautoimmune diseases, the mechanism of the neuroautoimmunity is antibody mediated. So there are uh, bad B cells that have somehow been tricked into making antibodies to attack our own molecules, our own cells, our own proteins. And, um, and if those proteins and cells and molecules are in the brain, then you end up with neuroautoimmunity. If they're in the joints, you end up with arthritis. Like the, the words that we give to antibody mediated autoimmunity is diverse. If it attacks your thyroid gland, we call it Hashimoto's. There's terms that have been given for decades to describe the various parts of the body that can get hit when antibodies start attacking those tissues. So in neuroautoimmunity, the, uh, the phenotype is really can be diverse. It can be everything from seizures to sleepiness because the, the parts of your brain that normally keep you awake are under attack. Uh, it can be, um, it can affect language. It can affect writing. It can affect all the different things that our brain mediates can be damaged. Um, psychiatric disorders too, neuropsychiatric uh, autoimmunity exists as well. So um, with that in mind, if you're going to try to slow down antibody mediated autoimmunity, you have to come up with drugs that are going to block that part of the immune system, but hopefully don't damage the rest in the immune system so that you can still tolerate colds and, and other things. Um, you don't want to be debilitated if somebody sneezes on you. And so picking the right kind of 
immune suppressant based on the mechanism of the autoimmunity is a trick. It's an art. Uh, and how much immune suppression is needed to control how much autoimmunity uh, is also an art. There are very few good biomarkers and tools that we can measure uh, from the blood or from the spinal fluid to be able to say, okay, we've hit it just right. Those don't really exist. Um, and so instead, a lot of it is, ends up being empirical and based on experience and based on, you know, having the right person um, pushing those uh, immune suppressant buttons at just the right setting. Um, so uh, with that in mind, uh, IVIG is immune globulins that are purified from people. Uh, typically 10,000 plus donors give plasma uh, they're paid for it. They are uh, screened for HIV and hepatitis and other viruses. They're generally healthy, like blood donors. And uh, But th their plasma is being collected not by the Red Cross, but rather by for-profit companies that then um, purify away as much of the clotting factors and other proteins that are in the blood and try to just purify as best as they can the immune globulins, the antibodies that are circulating in the blood. And they package that up and sell it as a product. For many patients who don't have antibody immunity, like some of these experiments of nature that, that I take care of with a monkey wrench that's thrown into their B cells and they don't make antibodies, uh, we need to use immune goblin to replace the antibodies that they don't make at all or that they make in a, in a poor fashion. But when you can give Ig at a very high dose, uh, it turns out to have an immune suppressant capability. Uh, this is part of our evolution. I think uh, it's a really fascinating idea that every time you get a cold or a severe infection and you make a whole new set of antibodies to fight that one, um, you have to make room for those B cells and those memory B cells to find a place that they can continue to make their antibodies for the next five to 10 years. And they push some of the older memory B cells and plasma cells off. Um, and they say, hey, you're whatever it is that you're making antibodies for, uh, that was 10 years ago. We, we kind of don't need you around anymore. You should leave, make room on the bench for me so I can sit here and make antibodies for 10 years. And uh, maybe I'll get pushed off the ben bench in a couple of years, but for now I'm needed and you're not. And the way that our body does that is those older plasma cells sense the high burst of antibodies that are produced during an infection. And they take that as a cue to say, okay, there's a new sheriff in town. There's a new pathogen in town. My buddies out there are fighting that war. And you know what? This thing, tetanus that I got vaccinated for 10 years ago, I haven't seen it yet. It's been 10 years. I can just sort of fade away a little bit and not have not take up so much room here. And that makes room for other B cells to become plasma cells and to produce their protective immunity, their memory for the next few years. So high levels of immunoglobulin are a cue to get rid of some antibody making cells. We use that trick and we give blasts of high dose immunoglobulins to try to get rid of the B cells that are making autoantibodies, that are making the antibodies that are attacking our own tissues. And if you give it again and again, you can sometimes get lucky and bump off that clone of plasma cells and B cells that was causing all the harm. And then the autoimmune disease fades away over the course of a few months. Now, it's important to remember that antibodies don't disappear very quickly. The half-life of an antibody, whether it's a good antibody protecting you from an infection or a bad antibody that's attacking your body, the half-life of those antibodies is about a month, which means it takes four or five months to get down to the level of like a few percent. Um, so even if you gave a miracle treatment of Ig today, uh, mm -hmm. you may start to see some benefit in a few weeks, but it really may be months before we really expect to see like the kind of win that says, hey, it's over for you. That autoimmunity is gone. Um, and so it's important that when we do uh, courses of high-dose IVIG, we think about them in sort of six-month blocks uh, with this sort of tra kinetic trajectory in mind, that you're unlikely to get a win in your first course of IG. It has to take many months of it, and you have to be monitoring it for months to really get a sense whether we're making some upper ground. There are other drugs that hit those B cells and hit those plasma cells harder than high-dose high IVIG. In the end, that is a, a mild immune suppressant. Uh, the stronger drugs are drugs that are um, made in a, in a lab. They're, they're antibodies too, but they're fabricated specifically to target B cells or plasma cells and obliterate them. And those are drugs like rituximab that you mentioned, daratumumab, inabilizumab. There's so many mabs out there that target B cells or plasma cells and try to get rid of humoral or, or antibody-mediated immunity. They're stronger. They hit harder. 
they eliminate the ability to make antibodies for a few weeks or months. Uh, many patients uh, will end up with low antibody states for a while uh, as a result of these treatments. Uh, they're more susceptible to infections. So it is harder hit. And depending on the level of autoimmunity, the practitioner has to decide how much of a push we're going to give. Is high dose IVIG enough? Do we have to add on rituximab? Do we have to add on another drug and another drug to really keep hitting these antibodies making cells until we can clear the autoimmunity? One question I commonly get is, is Ig, is immunoglobulin G an actual immune suppressant and will it interrupt my ability to fight off colds or flus or covid other things. How immunosuppressive is it? Yeah, uh, high dose IVIG, not the replacement doses, but the high doses that neurologists often use to suppress the immune system is an immune suppressant. It will uh, bump off those older making uh, antibody making cells. Uh, in general, it doesn't prevent the new B cells from responding to new infections, new pathogens, etc. In that way, it's a relatively mild immune suppressant. Uh, it has been shown that with patients on IVIG, uh, that you can give them an ant a vaccine, for example, to a totally new antigen, and their B cells will boot up and make antibodies and protect you from that antigen uh, as if the Ig wasn't coming in. Okay, so in that way, high dose IV Ig is a relatively mild immune suppressant for the antibody needed as part of the immune system, as compared with rituximab, which blows away all those B cells that were going to respond to a vaccine and it eliminates your ability to make a vaccine response. If I give you a two doses of rituximab and then give you a vaccine to an antigen you've never seen before, there will be no antibody response one month later, period. Yeah. So for patients who are getting COVID vaccine, it's important to know what level of immune suppression they're getting. If they're just getting high dose of the IG, they most certainly should get the COVID vaccine and they most certainly should expect an antibody response and it can be checked. Uh, one month after their second dose, you can check to make sure that they got a good response. And there are some groups now advocating for third doses in some of those patients with mild immunosuppression who could benefit from another booster. Uh, we're waiting to see if that actually will end up being in the approval. Um, for patients who are on rituximab, on the other hand, or these stronger immune suppression drugs that eliminate B cells, uh, the chances of making an antibody response after COVID vaccine are much lower. Of course, mm -hmm. as good as rituximab is to blowing away B cells, it doesn't get rid of all of them. It gets rid of all the circulating ones. Your B cell counts in your blood drop to zero. But in the tissues and in the lymph nodes, and in the, especially in the gut, uh, some of those B cells do persist. They're, they hide away from the rituximab. And so th that's why there's still a chance that patients even on rituximab can make antibody responses to the COVID vaccine. It's just much less likely. So folks on rituximab can get COVID vaccination. They just may not make a response, but it shouldn't be detrimental. That's right. Yeah, there, there's no detrimental effect to having the antigen expressed in your tissues for a few weeks, uh, which is what the vaccines do. It just means that you won't make an antibody response. Now, it is important to know that um, the COVID vaccine doesn't just make antibody responses. It also makes T cell responses. Mm -hmm. And patients who are on rituximab have totally normal T cell responses. Rituximab doesn't touch T cells even a little bit. And so um, the COVID vaccine will be greatly beneficial for patients who are on rituximab in that it will drive the totally normal activation and memory responses of T cells uh, so that you will get good protective immunity. It's not as much protective immunity as you would have if you had both B cells and T cells working for you, but it's pretty good. And, uh, and we certainly don't recommend that anyone on rituximab not get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. It's just harder to tell, did they get a good T cell response? Because we don't have a test for that. There is. Do you know the T detect? Yeah. I'm from curious. adaptive. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about that test? You know, it's probably, so the, the way that the test works is that they look for the T cell receptor genes mm -hmm. that have shown up in patients who've had COVID. And they say, well, if you have these T cell receptor genes in your blood, that means you've probably had COVID. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's looking for, it's sort of a pattern matching trick. It's not asking your T cells, can you respond to COVID antigen, mm. which would be a better test, mm -hmm. um, unambiguously better test. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's sort of asking, you know, do your T cells collect the same stamps as these other people's T cells <laughs> who have responded to COVID? Like it, it's an indirect test. And, you know, I, I'm not a super fan of it because we know of a much better way of activating, uh, of testing T cells and their responses. It's by triggering them and asking, do they become activated? Okay. Uh, it's just not clinically available. There's no clinically available test to right. activate T cells to COVID. We get a lot of requests and we do offer that test in our clinic. 
the oh, okay. text for folks who are interested in it. And, you know, there are people who are trying to figure out from antibody tests and T cell tests. And so that, because that's the one that's available, that's the one we have used, but yeah, I was curious about your take on it. Yeah. I, I mean, it's good for now. I think what will be better is the You're same right. way that we detect T cells that respond to tetanus um, and has been published now for months and months from, from top notch T cell immunologists uh, at Penn, at Scripps, at Loa Institute. There's a number of great immunologists who've shown the way how to make this a great test. Um, so I, I think it's, um, it's not that hard. My lab has even done it. It's, it's not hard to do. Yeah. No one has turned it into a clinical test, which means it has to go through all of that quality control and sort of um, testing needed to really okay. mint a test that, that can be used in a clinical setting and not a research setting. That's essentially our time. I feel like we could go on and on and on. And maybe there's a potentially another sh- podcast in our future just talking more about other therapeutic options for allergy, autoimmunity, and infection. Are there any last thoughts that you have that you want to share just to kind of wrap up our conversation today? Um, you know, I think one thing that we would love to have a lot of patients and, and neurologists know about is the, um, the genetic basis of diseases. A lot mm-hmm. of times autoimmune diseases, especially are thought of as acquired diseases, they show up and you have to deal with them. Mm-hmm. Um, but for many of our patients, we found that these autoimmune diseases have an underlying genetic basis to them, that the tendency to autoimmunity was already in, encoded in the genes. And whether that autoimmunity is thyroid or brain could be very important to figure out if there's an underlying gene driving it because it creates new options for treatment. Uh, We have patients who have thyroid and other autoimmune diseases and an underlying gene. And instead of picking steroids or methotrexate or rituximab or high dose IVIG or azathioprine or, you know, all the medicines, there's 20, 30 different immunosuppressive drugs we could pick. Instead, we pick the one that is targeted to their genetic defect. And that kind of targeted therapy is the difference between using a a sharp knife and a blunt knife. Like you you end up with a much better cut if you do it right. Less bleeding, less damage, less um, (laughs) bystander injury to all the other parts of the immune system that get hit hard with steroids or or other medicines Mm -hmm. when they're used imprecisely. So this idea of precision medicine, uh, the right drug for the right patient at the right time, uh, certainly already exists in immunology. And we find that a lot of our patients just aren't aware of it. And a lot of doctors aren't aware of it. They're not aware that genetic testing can give them the hints they might be needing to pick the right immunosuppressive drug for this patient. Um, You know, I I would say that as a parting thought, you know, I would love to make sure that um, the audience asks for genetic testing around the immune system and the genes that regulate the immune system. And are there panels that you commonly use? There are some companies have marketed panels for genes that are important for the immune system, like these uh, inborn errors of immunity that that I study. Uh, so gene panels are one way to approach it. Another way to approach it is what's called whole exome sequencing. So instead of just taking a few dozen or a few hundred genes, it's, it sequences all 20,000 genes in the in the genome. So depending on what your insurance will pay for and who the doctor is who's going to actually be interpreting it, different tests might be have different utility. In our hands, um, we tend to go straight for the exome sequencing because we want to look at not just the genes that are already known about, but new ones that we're trying to discover in patients. Mm -hmm. The exome gives you all that data. Uh, We've even found that genome sequencing is, which is um, about 50 times as much data as exome sequencing, covers the entire genome one end to the other. Genome sequencing provides even more data, more chances at discovering the genetic lesions that cause disease and is really quite cheap at this point. You can get <laughs> on a research level, genome testing is down to about six or $700. A few years ago, that was 10000 yeah. So there, there have been some revolutions in the tools of sequencing just in the last few years that have made this stuff clinically actionable, clinically possible. So, you know, I want your listeners to know that this is useful and they should ask for it and they should be prepared to hear from their payers, their insurance companies, that it's not useful and not actionable and not going to be paid for. And this is the next fight that we need to have. We need to make sure that our patients um, get the kind of diagnosis and treatment that they need. That the old stodgy, you know, uh, approaches to thinking about genetic testing as some sort of experiment uh, are wrong and have been wrong for 10 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need to let, you know, the, the, the companies out there, the payers like Anthem and others, they need to pay for these tests. 
Yeah, because they actually make healthcare cheaper in the long run because you can actually use that sharp knife and there's not yeah. that much blood. In immune deficiencies, that has been studied uh, by the Jeffrey Modell Foundation and others, and they've shown that the annual costs for taking care of immune deficiency patients prior to diagnosis versus after diagnosis uh, drops by about $100,000 a year. <sighs> That's in MRIs and scans and various tests that were being done uh, looking for why this patient is sick all the time. And once you make an immune deficiency diagnosis, suddenly uh, there's the ability to treat it with immune globulin and other sort of medicines and, and targeted therapies. The allure of precision medicine is to try to get patients on diagnosed earlier and on the right treatments and in the end, it should save money. Sequencing also is going to include sequencing um, the mitochondrial DNA because one other topic we haven't talked about. I'm 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 trying not to just keep you here talking and talking and talking, but you know um, the other topic we haven't really touched yeah. on is the role of the mitochondria and and how they are they're they're not necessarily part of a traditional view of the immune system, but they certainly play a huge role in how our body senses and responds. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, you know, I guess it depends on how much training people have had in metabolism. You know, mm -hmm. it, it is it is an esoteric subject and a lot of <laughs> uh, doctors really try to get through that part of medical school as fast as they can. <laughs> yes. uh, for me, you know, our lab has been studying T-cell metabolism. As I mentioned, the mechanosensing parts of the mm -hmm. immune system happen to drive a lot of their influence on the turning on and turning off of the immune system through metabolism. And uh, we've launched a handful of metabolism projects now in the lab as a result of those uh, first steps a few years ago. Uh, it's super fascinating. And I think um, the idea that you can detect mitochondrial diseases that overtly affect muscles and bones and, and all the um, sort of externally obviously visible phenotypes also affect the T-cells is something that we've been studying and um, working on with our Undiagnosed Disease Network here. Uh, we've solved actually a handful of cases uh, that are mitochondrial disorders by looking at the T-cells. Um, and so, you know, yes, there's a lot to learn still about how mitochondria not just make power, but handle and process a, a variety of metabolites. Um, everything from making lipids, you know, has to come from a metabolic program um, to making, you know, processing sugars like glucose. And yes, it's a, it's a very long conversation to talk about <laughs> immune metabolism, uh, but, but super fascinating. And we do know of diseases, immune diseases, where the mitochondria are the parts that are broken and lead to chronic infections or autoimmunity. So cool. <laughs> it's a really live field. Yeah. It's a really, it's a field that there is lots and lots changing in. And we've had some rheumatologists and some immunologists who have talked about how HIV, the HIV epidemic really kicked off this look again at the immune system. And it's one, it's like the gift that keeps on giving, you know, every time you peel away a layer, there's like, oh, there's more. Right. Um, this I would say COVID is the, you know, is the HIV of yes. the 80s. You know, the COVID now is just a real amazing chance for immunologists to flex, um, to say all these tools we built in the lab to study mice and how T cells evolve and how antibody responses rise and fall, all those things that we've learned, uh, we can apply to humans and uh, to the scourge. And it's just been amazing to watch, you know, the mm -hmm. Uh, whether you whether you follow it on Twitter or whether you actually read these uh, articles yourself um, in the journals, uh, it has been a revolution, uh, a real revolution to studying how uh, our immune responses work. Amazing. And how long is it going to take for the antibodies to wane? Do we know? From COVID? Antibodies to COVID? Yeah. Yeah. Remember, antibodies themselves have a half-life of about one month. So if you make an antibody today and then I eliminate your entire immune system, that antibody will stay in your blood. Uh, for about four or five months. So we expect there to be a trajectory of decline over time. That's necessary. Otherwise, our blood would fill up with antibodies uh, from every infection <laughs> we've ever had. They have to fade away. They get recycled. They get turned over like other proteins and used for parts. Um, so antibodies are just like that. They have a half-life of about a month. So you would expect over about four or five months, some level of antibody immunity to start fading away. Mm -hmm. What's more important is not the level of antibody, but whether those B cells are around that can quickly surge and respond, those memory B cells that I mentioned earlier, whether they can surge and produce a whole flood of antibodies upon being re-triggered again. Uh, mm -hmm. That memory immunity turns out to be, um, you know, in a lot of ways more important than the little trickle of antibodies that they continue to make mm -hmm. and at what level. Mm -hmm. So we 
you know, test for immunity a lot of times by looking at antibody levels, mm. but it's a very indirect measurement mm-hmm. and probably not enough to be able to say, um, oh, you, you don't have protection. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that I don't think that's too much of a leap. And I do remember there was one study I was looking at that looked at SARS-CoV-1 that found T cell activation, I think 11 years later. So it looks like, and I'm curious here. Yeah, absolutely. Memory T cells can last for, as I mentioned, five, 10 years easily. Yeah. There have been studies uh, documented, um, you know, fantastic T cell immunologists have, have shown that T cell responses to smallpox can last an entire lifetime, uh, 60 or 70 years. Wow. Uh, those memory T cells can hang out sitting in the lymph nodes, dormantly waiting for a smallpox <laughs> antigen to come around again. Uh, and we know this from people who either had natural smallpox or, inf- or vaccination and measure the half-life of their T cell responses. And it, the half-life is decades, not, um, not, not years. So it's, yeah, some T cells renew themselves in a stem-like program where they can continue to keep a memory mode going for the entire life of the person. Uh, other T cells, maybe not so much. They only do last for five or 10 years and you need to get another booster. Uh, how vaccines and infections drive these sort of short-lived and long-lived responses is still a lot to learn. Even the stem-like properties of T cells is only a very recent discovery. Uh, there's just so much to learn still. <laughs> And because then there's the conversation about stem cells in terms of everything else in our immune system. So maybe we can table that for another day. Yeah, I think we'll have to. Well, thank you so much. Um, any last thoughts? I think we've talked a lot. <laughs> I know we have. Okay, I'm good. Overwhelm the audience. But anyway, oh, it's been really great. You've you know, um, given me a chance to uh, share some of the things that we've been working on. And you know, it's a very exciting time. I think immunologists tend to be optimists, like the community of immunologists that I hang out with are very excited, very excited about COVID, very excited about the boosts and vaccine capabilities that we have um, on the horizon uh, and, and even in use now, the mRNA vaccines, et cetera. There's just so much opportunity that has become available for study, for invention. Uh, it's just a great time. It is a really great time. And we're really glad to have you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. So thank you for listening today with Dr. Manish Butte. We've got lots of ways to continue this conversation through Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also get more information from and about Dr. Butte at his lab website, which is tcell.mimg.ucla.edu. Um, and you can get more information about us at our website, centerforhealingneurology.com. Please be sure to share the show with your friends and we welcome your rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. We love that you've joined us today to discuss how to make our whole world medicine. We rise or fall together and we're committed to doing what we can to make as many of us as healthy as possible. And this takes all of us, including you. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. Media. Party Fish Media acknowledges that it operates and records on indigenous Duwamish and Puget Sound Coast Salish land that is still home to the Duwamish tribe. This land is stolen in violation of the Point Elliot Treaty of 1855. We are committed to uplifting the name of these lands and community members from these nations who reside alongside us. For more information on this land, its people, or ways you can help, visit duwamishtribe.org or realrentduwamish.org.